Yeah. And then, let me get out the phone again. The 14th, October 14th. At 7. At the Wesley. Good question. At the Wesley, October 14th at 7 o'clock. And then, girls' night, October 18th at 7. What, if I had to take a guess what that is, it's probably a night for the girls to hang out, of course, and, you know, have a blast. When's boys' night? Every night is boys' night. Yeah! Okay, now let me get to my fancy dancy stuff. Okay. Uh, October 12th. Does any of y'all know what that is? What is it? What is it? Homecoming football game. Wow! Yeah. So, uh, alumni and students are invited. At 10 a.m., there will be gathering. There will be Palace Coffee and Donuts. What, what? Uh, and then, oh, the coffee is free at the Wesley. Woo! And then at 1 o'clock, there is the homecoming parade. And then we'll get ready for kickoff at 7 p.m. Woo! And then, and then, tailgate. That's 3 o'clock. Yeah. Man, I like this. Y'all are helping me so much. October 12th. October 12th. And then after the homecoming game, there is fifth quarter. Woo! Guess where that's at? The Wesley. It's a party hardy. In the basement at the Wesley. Bro, why do y'all got to attack me? And then October 27th, there is a chili cook-off. Woo! There are, to sign up, they will be at the window at the Wesley office inside the Wesley. Yes. What that is? Um, I'm glad you asked. It's uh, a cook-off. Yeah. It's the biggest fundraiser of the year, chili cook-off. Woo! Now, time for West Worship of the Lord. Yeah. <laughs> that is why I'm making the announcement. No, I'm kidding. Okay, yeah, Tucker. Good job, Tucker. Good job. Okay, hey, friends. I'm Kristen. I'm here uh, announcing once again to you that we are going to be having some worship team auditions. So if you want to be a part of this team that just loves to worship the Lord and help, help y'all worship the Lord as well, uh, if you've got a passion for it, whether that's singing, whether you play an instrument, anything like that, if you even just have questions about it and what being a part of this team looks like, um, I will be in the back uh, after Tupos um, by the light bulb. I have, also if you came to me last week or you submitted through the app that you wanted to audition, uh, please come find me. I have some packets of information for you tonight. So yeah, come see me. We're going to have those uh, and sign ups on the window for a time slot, but we're going to have those on October 17th and 18th. So just let me know if you have any questions. Bye. I should be unmuted. There we go. All oh, right. So. Okay. Calm down. All right, guys. So. <laughs> there we go. You might need to pull it down. There we go. I put the microphone in my pocket and muted it at the same time. So we're multitasking up here. So, all right guys, so Mikey wasn't feeling well today. Um, and if you don't know me, my name is Sabby. I am our Associate Director of Development. Woo. That's a fancy title for fundraiser. So um, I get to go and travel to a bunch of different churches in our area and kind of share about the cool things you guys and we are seeing God do here. Um, and so I was speaking at a church this last Sunday, 
and I was texting Mikey when I was writing that sermon because I was super excited about it. Um, and then today when Mikey woke up, he wasn't feeling well, so he texted me and said, hey, um, will you fill in? I'm really not feeling well. Uh, will you do the sermon that you just did? I was like, okay, he's never heard it, but here we are. So um, before I start, I just want to pray because I never want anything to be out of my own words. I never want to speak out of like any sort of like human interaction, but really just kind of pull through the scripture, what I feel like God wants to highlight today. So if you'll just bow your heads with me. Lord, we just give you this space and we give you this time. Father, I pray that no words of mine come out today. Father, I pray that I'm open and willing to listen to your Holy Spirit. If you lead us in another direction, I pray, Lord, that I'm open and sensing and willing to go in that direction. Father, I just pray right now for Mikey. I pray, Lord, that you bring him some relief. Father, being sick and being sick and missing one of your favorite things to do uh, just hurts the heart and hurts the soul. And so, Lord, I just pray for healing for Mikey. I pray for rest and relief for him. I pray for the whole family. I pray that no sickness spreads. Father, I pray for this message tonight. Lord, I pray that we're just ready to see what you want to show us. May this be your words, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Uh, so when I was in college, I um, was kind of living a little crazy my first semester and was kind of in and out of the Wesley. If you guys have been around, if you've known me, you've kind of heard that story a little bit. Um, and it was September 22nd, 2015, that I came to Tuco's and I just gave the Lord everything. I said, Lord, I don't want anything in my life that is going to pull me further away from you. And so that started this kind of deep journey in my walk while I was a student of like, okay, if there was anything that pulled me away from the Lord, if there was anything that pulled my attention and my heart away from the Lord, I was going to cut it out. That was just kind of a rule. I wanted the Lord over anything else. And so um, it got to the point where I was very mindful of what music I was listening to. Um, I got to the point where I was like, okay, I'm not going to have any streaming services because the shows that I'm watching aren't feeding my soul and they're not godly. Um, and so I just started cutting things out. And some may call that extreme. Um, and hear me, I'm not saying that I am the benchmark or the model. I'm just saying that's what I did in my life as my, I was convicted by the Holy Spirit to be able to um, walk holy and walk righteous and walk like the Lord. And when I graduated college, I hit this weird point where I was like, maybe I'm too tough. Maybe I'm too hard on things. And so I'm going to loosen up a little bit. Some of my friends like tend to make some of these jokes. I'm going to make some of these jokes. And I started listening to a lot more popular music. And I started, uh, I, I had streaming services again. And then it was um, last December that I was in my room and I just got really convicted about the content that I was consuming. Because the content I was consuming wasn't glorifying the Lord. And I'm not saying that secular music is bad, I'm just saying that the music I was listening to was putting things in my heart and in my mind and in my soul that weren't godly. Um, and so I was in my room and I was praying uh, just through this conviction of the Lord and um, God kind of reminded me of how I walked in college and how I was ruthless in how I wanted, uh, ruthless in eliminating anything from my life that I felt like got in the way of my relationship with God. And so um, I was reminded of the book of James, which if you know me, that's my favorite book of the Bible. Um, I'm quoting it all the time. Uh, but when I was in college, I remember I read the book of James for the first time. And I was like, oh my goodness, this is all of the answers to how to walk as a Christian. This is great. Um, and so... Um, I was reminded of that. So in this moment of crying, confessing to the Lord, uh, I, I opened up my Bible and I started reading the book of James. And I got through the first chapter. And the last verse of the first chapter is James 127. And it says, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. And I read that, and I realized that I had let myself become stained 
by the world. The things that were coming out of my mouth around my friends were not godly, they were worldly. Um, and so I, I decided that I was going to keep reading the book of James over the next few days. Um, and I got to James chapter 4. And that's what tonight's topic comes from. It's from verses 7 and 8. And right before these verses, uh, there's a verse that says, Friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God. And then it goes into these verses and it says, uh, Submit yourself, yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Another thing when I was in college was uh, there was an older student that really discipled me for a long time. And she was challenging me and a couple of girls that she was discipling. Is that mic getting in the way? Do I need to move that? Am I good? Okay. I heard a little feedback, and I know that it's weird. So, um, but she was like, hey, guys, let's work on memorizing scripture. And she had picked out these verses. And so one week we were memorizing uh, verse 7. And we were like, yeah, you know, it's easy. Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil. He'll flee from you. Great. And then the next week we got to verse 8. And we were trying to memorize it. And I remember it was one night after 2 plus. She was like, what's verse 8? And I, I got to the uh, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. And I couldn't remember the rest of the verse. And I think that we do that intentionally. I think that often the rest of that verse is what gets forgotten because it's not necessarily what we want to hear. And so cleanse your heart, your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. So if there were to be a sermon for, or a title for tonight's sermon, it's Resist the Devil. And we're going to be going off of these, uh, <laughs> we're going to be going off of these uh, scriptures from James and a few others today. And this whole thing in December kind of spurred me um, on a journey of, I want to really dig into the book of James. Um, there's these uh, study books that Mikey does and the staff does. They're by K. Arthur. There's one for almost every book of the Bible. Um, and they walk you through, like, week one, day one, read James one, and highlight these words. Um, and all of the staff can show you how to do this if you're interested in that stuff. But I was like, okay, the Lord had actually told me to go through this uh, in James like three years prior, but I didn't. So uh, I finally, in January, I was like, all right, we're going to do this. And I went through the book of James from January through May. Um, and tonight, we're just kind of kind of look at some of the stuff that I learned just from like reading scripture at face value, rereading it, um, and asking questions about it. There wasn't any heavy interpretation or anything like that. It was really just, all right, what does this scripture have to say about temptation? And so um, tonight we're going to look at temptation, and then we're going to look at if we fall into sin, what do we do? And then we're going to look at how do we resist the devil? And so to start with, um, temptation. The Webster definition of temptation is enticed to evil, provoked, tried. James chapter 1, verses 13 and through 15 says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil. And he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. So what do we learn about temptation from this? We learn that temptation does not come from God. But each person is tempted when they're enticed lured by their own desire, or I would say flesh nature. Uh, Galatians 5 says, uh, verse 17, for the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you do not do whatever you, whatever you want. So desire, this flesh nature, gives birth to sin, and sin gives birth to death. So, what I think is beautiful about the Bible is that um, there's this thing called cross-references where 
you can talk about a subject and you can look at all these scriptures and all these different books of the Bible that all talk about this subject. Um, and so you're just kind of bringing them together. What? Let's get an overall look on what does the Bible say about temptation. So we're going to look at a few more verses tonight. Is that all right? Yeah. All right. I've, I'd encourage you to write down the addresses, but I will have them all on the screen. So 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13 says, No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation, will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. So let's look at this with our question again. What does this teach us about temptation? You're not being tempted by anything that isn't common. Yes, different people have different things that they are tempted by. That is a very real thing. However, everything that we are tempted with is not uncommon to man. You're not alone in whatever, is, uh, whatever your temptation is. Um, what we also learn is God will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with that temptation, God provides a way out so we can endure it. So we're, we're going to be tempted in this world. That's going to happen. In Scripture, the devil tempts Jesus in the, in the wilderness, and we're going to talk about that as well. Um, so you're going to deal with temptation at some point, okay? Um, the thing is, God gives us the way out. So you can be like, Savvy, okay, God gives us the way out. What is that? Well, it could look like the moment that you're tempted to sin, you get a call from one of your friends. It could be like the moment that uh, you're tempted to sin, you have a thought. You're like, wait a minute. This isn't right. It could be some random distraction that happens. But that is God providing the way out. And... Um, and so Deuteronomy says, there's life and there's death. Choose life. We have free will, right? So in those moments when you're tempted and when God gives you that, that pause, that, hey, maybe you shouldn't, that distraction, that text, that phone call, that's the moment where you choose. You can choose to sin because your desire gives birth to sin, or you can choose life. And so, continuing on with verses about temptation, 1 Corinthians 6, verses 12 through 20, speaks a lot on this. And that can be its own sermon within itself. So, I'm just going to bullet point some things we learn from that passage about temptation. So, in verse 12, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are profitable. Verse 13, our, it says our body is for the Lord. Verse 15 says your body is a member of Christ. Verse 18 says to flee immorality. Just like how I said, I'm going to cut out anything that is going to tear me, that is going to put something in between me and God. Uh, verse 19, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you. And verse 20, glorify God with your body. Um, and there's a lot more in there. I'd encourage you to read that. But that's just specifically about temptation I wanted to bring up this morning, or tonight, sorry. <laughs> so now we looked at temptation. But now I want to go to the next thing, where let's say we fell into sin. What do we do? I'm not up here preaching from a place of perfection. I have fallen into sin. I'm not immune. Just because this is something I'm passionate about, doesn't mean I'm immune. But when we fall into sin, the last thing we want to do is go to God. When we fall into sin, I don't know about you, I feel like God is completely on the other end of the room, totally far from me, doesn't want anything to do with me. But God never leaves us. God is right here. But we feel like he's far away because sin is not of God. And so sin makes us feel 
that conviction that it's not of God, right? The last thing we want to do is go to God. And this next scripture that I read, which I accidentally quoted that it's from the book of James, but it's not. I just learned it when I was studying the book of James. Um, This scripture completely, completely transformed the way that I go to the Lord. And so it's Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15 and 16. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness but one who has been tempted in all things, as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Jesus can sympathize with our weakness. Jesus was tempted as we were, but he did not sin. Therefore, when we sin, even though we feel like God is so far away, we have to draw near. And what does it say? Draw near with confidence. I think about Adam and Eve in the Bible. When they sinned, they began to hide. They're hiding from God, right? That's what we do. We feel that because sin is outside of God's character. If we have the Holy Spirit within us, we're going to feel that that separation. We're going to feel that dissonance, right? We want to hide. We don't want to go to the God, go to God. We'll wait weeks, months to go to God. But we're supposed to draw near to him in confidence. And why do we draw near to him in confidence? So we can receive his mercy. It's one of those things where it's like when you're amping yourself up to have a conversation and you're like, everything's going to blow up and they're going to be so angry at me. And then you have the conversation, you're like, oh, wait, that wasn't bad. (laughs) This is what it's like. This This is what we should be doing when we fall, when we fall into sin. We should go to the Lord. So we learn that we need to draw near with confidence. James 4 promises that God will draw near when we draw near to him, right? It's the same language there. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. And then also, remember, as we read earlier, James 4, verse 8, talks about this analogy of cleansing hands. And my next scripture is 1 John, uh, verses 8 and 9. And it says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we talked about temptation. We talked about what that looks like and that we're enticed by our own desires, our own flesh nature, right? We talked about when we sin, we need to draw near to the confidence of God. And that is a promise that he will forgive us when we confess our sins to him. But here's the thing. Christianity is not supposed to be this repetitive cycle of falling into sin, God, I'm sorry. Falling into sin, God, I'm sorry. It happens, yes. Is that a reality? Yes. But we are not supposed to use God's forgiveness as a measure to do and fall into our desires. We are not supposed to use God's promise to forgive us to live and be a friend in the world. And to be like, oh, I'll just repent and say sorry, and then everything will be fine. That is not what I'm talking about tonight, and that is not what I'm talking about when I say we have to draw near to receive his forgiveness. And so with that, we get to this last portion, which is resist the devil. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself. (laughs) When we sin, we must draw near to God. And when we confess our sins, it cleanses us. Remember, wash your hands, it cleanses us. Then we receive his mercy, we receive his grace. But many times, I think, when we confess our sins to God, God is just and, and, and faithful to forgive us, but we are not faithful to forgive ourselves. And I feel like there's a lot of moments where I'm talking to people, and 
they're telling me about a moment where they're confessing, right? And they're like, I already said this to God. I'm like, okay. But when we struggle to believe that we're actually forgiven, which we should feel repentance, we should feel conviction, but we shouldn't fall into this cycle of shame. Now, conviction, that's the Holy Spirit. That's us knowing, and, and we should feel sorrowful when we bring it to the Lord. But when we choose that we're not going to forgive our sins after we've brought everything to the Lord and he's cleansed us and he's forgiven us, then are we saying that, that we are stronger than the Lord or that we are above the Lord? And But I find that I think, it's, I think it stems from our heart wants to do the things of God. Um, scripturally, there's a, there's a portion in the epistles that says, I, I do not do what I want to do, but I do what I do not want to do, right? And, um, and something that I, that I found, this was honestly just the Holy Spirit. I was praying with someone, and this psalm and this number popped into my head, which isn't actually normal for, like, me, and, and, and I don't just normally, oh, here's the scripture, let's read it. Um, but we were in a moment of prayer, it popped into my head, and I was like, okay, and so I was like, hey, I think we're supposed to read this. I don't know what it is. And I open it up, and then I'm like, oh, I'm going to keep this. Uh, and so Psalm 32. Um, whenever I'm struggling to forgive myself or someone else is struggling to forgive themselves, I read this over myself, and I read this over them. Because you can pray the Psalms, and you can pray Scripture, right? And so Psalm 32 uh, I, re I read the whole thing, but for this specific message, I'm going to go through verses 1 through 5. So this is a psalm of David, okay? Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. This is David. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up by the heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you. I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. And so, if you're struggling with forgiving yourself when you've brought the, your sin and confessed to the Lord, right? You have to lean into the fact and the promises that he will forgive you when you confess to him. And so now we, let's go into resisting the devil because we're not supposed to live in this constant cycle, right? Um, there's this like fancy Christianese word, Christianese word called sanctification, which is just a process of uh, becoming more righteous, becoming more holy, a.k.a living your life aligned with scripture, following God's word. Um, not, it's not this crazy thing you have to uh, strive for. It's if you're a Christian, you want to follow the, the commandments of God and you want to live as God-like, as Jesus-like. You want to look and be like Jesus, right? We, I've heard people say, it's like, you're the only picture of Jesus people are ever going to know, right? Well, are you living like Jesus? Do you strive to live like Jesus? I think about the scripture says, search my heart, O Lord, to reveal any wicked way within me, right? So we earlier I pointed out that temptation comes from our desires, from our flesh nature. And I believe that Satan pulls on our desires as a means to tempt us. So the scripture in James 4 that we read at the beginning was uh, resist the devil, right? What does it talk about with resist the devil? Well, Let's read in Matthew where Jesus was tempted by the devil. It says, verse 1 in Matthew, uh, it says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And this happened a few more times. Jesus was submitting his flesh to God through fasting. And the devil 
played on his, de- his flesh desire for food, for sustenance. And the devil was trying to tempt him into turning a stone into bread. So how did Jesus resist the devil? He didn't spend all of this time talking to the devil, saying, you this or you that. No, he quoted scripture at him. And honestly, for so long, I would just try to overcome sins in my life through prayer and willpower. And the thing was, my eyes weren't focused on Jesus and becoming more Christ-like. My eyes were focused on not sinning. And I feel like, I've read this before, I knew that Jesus quoted scripture at the devil. Had I forgotten it? Yeah. And so when I read this, I felt so stupid. <laughs> I'm just real. Like, I, I, Scripture is the answer to when we're dealing with temptation. It's not some special prayer. It's not, so I did set up disciplines for myself. I was cutting things out of my life, but did that remove the temptation? No, it just helped block me from falling into sin. But it was scripture that was the answer. Um, And in my study of James, uh, what it did for me was it broke down, as we were talking about cross-references, right? Well, it took Psalm 119, the longest uh, chapter in the Bible. Um, So everyone turn to Psalm 119. We're going to read 176 verses this morning. Night, (laughs) sorry. (laughs) I'm also joking, so, but we are going to read the, the few parts of Psalm 119 that talk specifically about um, temptation and sin, right? And so I'm just going to quote the, the verse and um, quote what I got from it, but I would encourage you to, to read it, honestly. It's awesome. Um, so v- verse 9, uh, what I learned from verse 9 was, if our way is according to God's word, it will be pure. From verse 11, if I treasure God's word in my heart, it will help me not sin against him. Verse 50, your word or promises revive me. So when I stumble and I dig into his word, I will be revived. Hence the praying Psalm 32. Um, Verse 98, your commandments make me wiser. Verse 105, your word is a lamp. Your word is what will guide me, which is why daily study of the word is vital. Am I perfect at reading scripture every single day? No, I am not. I'm going to be real. But I can tell you that whenever I'm getting relaxed on having my quiet times and when I'm relaxed on reading my scripture, oh, temptation comes and I'm weaker and I'm more likely to fall into it. It's not an accident. It's a cycle. I've noticed. Scripture is our answer to temptation. So if you're not in your scripture, temptation is going to feel stronger and you're going to feel weaker and you're going to give in more often. And so it's super powerful to keep God's word in our hearts. And it's super practical. One time I woke up and immediately just like scary images were passing through my head. And I just started quoting, like, the only thing I had memorized at the time, which was Psalm 23. And I was like, Lord, you are my shepherd. You lead me to green pastures. Uh, you, <laughs> you lead me beside restful waters. Lord, lead me in paths of righteousness according to your namesake. And I wasn't quoting it perfectly. I was just quoting what I could remember, right? But the second that I started quoting it, it disappeared. It was gone. Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And so I highly, highly, highly encourage committing some verses into memory. And I actually created a list for you guys of some verses that I use specifically um, that I have been working on committing into memory. If I don't remember the entire thing, I remember bits and parts of it. Well, different ones will pop up in different times. Um, But I just want to give you guys this resource because I don't want to tell you the importance of internalizing scripture and not give you a starting point. And so I see you guys. I knew, I knew Sid and Cole would come up and pass out papers. I didn't even tell them. So here we go. So um, 
That's just a list of some. That is very few. And uh, if you want some of those Psalm 119 verses, I'll give them to you. Find me afterwards. Um, but you don't have to pick these. There could be other scriptures. This is just a few that I remembered that I found in my study. Um, and, and even some of them just past my study of James, just as I started using scripture more, um, some of these I had revealed to, like God revealed to me, and I've been using them. And so some of them are pretty recent as well. Um, and so that's just a resource for you guys. You can keep it in your Bible. You can keep it in your journal. You can keep it on your wall. Um, and it doesn't have to be those, but those are just an opportunity to start internalizing some scripture that can help you resist the devil. And so as they pass that out, I'm just going to read verses 7 and 8 again. And um, worship team, you can get ready and come on up here. Um, but verses 7 and 8 of James chapter 4. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. And guys, I'm going to be real. As I was preparing this message, I realized that I've gotten lazy in internalizing Scripture into my heart. I gotten lazy. I did so good about it, obviously, when I was studying the book of James. And then po past the book of James, I just got lazy. I kind of kept the same three verses, and that I wasn't internalizing stuff, right? Um, and so, so as I had stated earlier, right, there'd be moments where I got lax, and then suddenly everything feels harder. And it's like, I, Lord, I just want to live holy. I'm like, well, the easy answer to that is internalizing his scripture, reading his word. And so I know that was a lot of scripture today. Um, and if you want like a copy of the like exact, like all the scriptures I use today, I can get those to you later, not tonight. Um, but I learned that as I was preparing this message, how important it really is to internalize scripture. And so we're going to go into a time of just being still before the Lord. And guys, like this is this is the time to just let God speak to you. Right? This is a time where if you have, as I was speaking, thought about something that you haven't confessed, this is a time to confess that to the Lord. If you realize that you felt like you were so far from God and you need to draw near to him. This is a time to draw near to him. Ignore the song that is playing. Draw near to him. And sometimes it may not even be about sin. I was having a really hard couple of weeks. And so at the retreat, I just took time and I was like, Lord, I'm just going to like block everything out of my mind and I'm going to draw near to you. And then the Lord was able to reveal what had been going on in my heart that I didn't know. And so if you need to forgive yourself, this is also a time for that. Take that time. Don't just let this be like, all right, cool message, cool, hard message about some sin and temptation. We love that. And then walk out those doors. And if you're in a great place, pray that God will reveal scriptures for you If you'll bow your heads with me, I'm going to pray. And then these altars are just completely open. You can come down and get face before the Lord. And just because you come up to the altar does not mean that you're, you know, you're a sinner and you have this like big thing you need to confess before God. It, can, it just means that you are taking a moment to get out of your space and out of your head and step and draw near to the Lord and seek him for what you need to seek him for. So if you'll bow your heads. Lord, we just give you this space. Father, I thank you.